Uh, my name is Justin Tognarine, and I'm the Operations Manager and Accessibility Coach at Carnegie Science Center in Pittsburgh. And I'm Ralph Crew, Program Development Coordinator at Carnegie Science Center. I help run our Buell Planetarium and Observatory and other sciencey stuff. Yeah, so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about the museum and sort of our adventure uh, and journey through accessibility um, that really started in 2014, 2015. Um, so we'll take you through that journey a little bit, uh, talk about some challenges, and then we'll uh, turn it over to you all. We have some poster paper on the tables um, that will have an activity, sort of a share out. Um, there's four different topics around the room. Some are repeated on the left side, my left side of the room. Uh, there are some uh, like fidget toys, and there's an adventure guy, which is our social store. You can take a look at those things as you want uh, throughout the presentation, that's fine. Um, we just put those out for you all to see as resources that we use. Uh, so, starting our journey, uh, accessibility at Carnegie Science Center. Um, our, like I said, our initiative started in 2015. Um, I started that initiative. Before that time, we really um, hadn't had a focus on accessibility. We had hands-on activities. Uh, we had wheelchairs you can rent, and that was basically it. Um, and so, from there, um, we started uh, forming community partnerships. We started an accessibility task force, which is our internal working group um, at the museum. Uh, the pictures up here show uh, the one on the left is one of our staff members who is uh, in a wheelchair. Um, and they're trying to get into our main building from the observatory on the fifth floor. And so what we did, one of the first uh, tasks that we did as a group with the accessibility task force uh, was I challenged all of them to get into wheelchairs and go through all the different parts of the building um, so that they can sort of see where the challenges are. This was one of the challenges. Uh, there's a lip there that uh, at the bottom uh, that you can't actually get back into the building. Um, and so that is still a challenge because we got it priced out to redo the observatory and it was multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. So uh, that's on hold for right now based on money. Uh, and so the other picture on the right there is our fabrication lab, our fab lab. Um, and that's, we had a community group come in. Uh, we wanted to make a sensory friendly workshop in our fab lab with 3D printers and laser, laser cutters and uh, vinyl cutters, so no idea how we're going to make it sensory friendly. So we brought in some folks um, and talked to them about it. And um, we've been demoing some workshops that are sensory friendly uh, hours. Uh, anything, uh, Ralph is part of the task force. Anything to talk about with the task force that I'm missing? Well, uh, one of the things that I found really rewarding about the task force is, so, so Justin was able to make accessibility a big part of his main job. But all of us other departments throughout the Science Center got this opportunity to sort of wrap that into what we do. And it's been really rewarding um, being able to do it as sort of an augmentation of the role that I already have. Um, so yeah, that's for now. And by the way, once we break out, we'll also be sort of circulating around. So if you guys have questions and stuff, we'll be able to address those then. Yeah, the biggest thing with the Accessibility Task Force, so I didn't have to sit in the hundreds of meetings that happen uh, and bring up accessibility, uh, was empowering that group. And so we started with seven or eight members on that task force. We're up to about 25 now um, in about four years. So uh, it's growing, um, and people are bringing up accessibility within meetings even though I'm not there. So that's the biggest thing is empowering those folks. Uh, and they're from all different departments, from the planetarium to development to um, to our floor staff, to our railroad, to all kinds of the submarines. So there's a bunch of people on those task force, on the task force. So uh, that's sort of a brief snapshot. Um, one interesting thing we had was um, we added a third to our building uh, in the last year. Um, and so that brought a lot of challenges because our original building was built in 1991 uh, and we were adding on to that. So we had to make a lot of facility upgrades uh, to the old building when we were doing major construction. And so um, these are some of the things we had to do on the left side. We had to get new lockers that were accessible because they're not accessible when you turn the wrist. Uh, and so these one, the one on the right, the accessible one has a sensor, a magnetic sensor um, that you can rent the key from the ticket counter. We had to redo all of our signage, so we um, rebranded our family restrooms too to all user restrooms. Uh, and so we had to 
create new tactile braille signage for all of our permanent areas. Uh, in the top right, we got new devices in our theater. So we went from a domed Omnimax theater um, that was not accessible. Uh, we didn't have very good assistive listening devices. We didn't have closed ca or closed or open captioning. We didn't have um, verbal descriptions, anything like that. And so we got new devices, the headsets on the top right, um, do assistive listening as well as verbal descriptions. Um, if they so choose. And then there's the closed captioning device in the left there uh, that they fit in the cup holder. Um, so those are two new devices we got. The bottom right uh, is like our most accessible spot in all the museum. Uh, there's four movie cases there um, that, and I'll get back to this later on, but they're at the non-protruding height. So if you have something between 27 inches and 80 inches, I believe, uh, it can only come out four inches. And so those are a little bit wider than four inches, but those are at the 27 inch height. So uh, it's perfect for people who are blind and use a cane. Um, they can detect those. And I'll come back to that later as we talk about challenges. And then the stanchions in front as well are ADA compliant because it has the lower um, the lower stanchion as well. So the double stanchions are uh, ADA compliant. When there's just the one stanchion at the top, it's not ADA compliant uh, because somebody with a cane will not be able to detect it. Uh, so that was, that was an interesting time, going through a construction project and uh, a 40 million con $40 million construction project and making everything accessible in an old building as well. Uh, it was a good time. Uh, and so on top of facility improvements, we've created uh, some programs. The pictures up here uh, are from our Sensory Sensitive Science um, Sundays, so lots of S's. Uh, we just had one on June 16th, Father's Day, which was an interesting uh, time because it's the summertime. It's typically busy. It was Father's Day. Um, we thought we wanted to create an, an opportunity for people, uh, for fathers who had kids on, that needed sensory adaptations to come into an organization that may they may not visit any other time. Uh, and so these are a couple of the pictures. We have our accessibility resource table, which some of those resources are out there on the tables, including our social stories. Uh, we have our communication badges. Uh, we had fidget spinners, weighted vests. We had these sensory backpacks. Um, that we provided as well. Uh, and some of those uh, materials people can get every day um, at the museum too, just on the, uh, during a normal visit as well. Um, but we brought them on a separate table so people can see them when they come in. And then in the bottom right, this is one of our additional tactile tables. He's holding up some kind of horns. I have no idea. Anybody know what those are? No? Okay. Yeah, so we got like uh, fox pelts and skunk pelts and all kinds of, it was a really popular tale. And I think this this is, has a turtle in it, the glass case. And we had cockroaches and we had all kinds of stuff that we could touch. So one of our additional tables that we might not have during normal operating hours, but we bring things out like that for our sensory hours. So yeah, our next one is in October. Uh, an additional accessible program, so we've done some outreach with accessible programming as well through our Fab Lab. Um, we talked about the sensory, uh, sensory community group that they brought in. Um, these two, so we worked with our Office of Vocational Rehabilitation Services uh, in the bottom left here, and so they made glider planes, which we have some of those. Ralph is going to show those off, so they used a laser cutter um, to make those. Um, and then in the top right corner, um, uh, so they do a lot of computer aided, that's actually a design from the office. So we use their file to make some of these props. Um, so we do a lot of computer aided design in the Fab Lab. Uh, however, if you're blind, you may not be able to participate. So we had to think outside the box and it, I feel like uh, accessibility is a lot of being creative, uh, creating creative solutions. Uh, and so we made a tactile aided design. Um, and so we have acrylic, one of the tables in the back corner there. Uh, and so instead of using a computer, what we did was um, we gave students acrylic um, and then we gave them either wiki sticks, which I think are on that one, um, we, or Play-Doh. We gave them scalpels. We gave them, gave them some um, very tactile pieces that they can make something. Um, and then we take a picture of it and then we send it to the laser cutter so they still can participate and then they can fill um, what they made. 
Um, the coolest story from the Fab Lab is we had somebody who was blind who had a service animal, and the service animal passed away, and so they gave them a paw print, a, like an ink paw print, but they were blind, so they couldn't interact with it. And so that we actually sketched and laser cut um, the paw print um, on acrylic so they can feel it and touch it and uh, feel what that paw uh, felt like. So it was a really cool moment for us, um, which we have that floating around or somewhere too, that you guys can take a look uh, if you like. Uh, and so since this is sort of an astronomy kind of conference, uh, Ralph is going to talk a little bit again about the planetarium and sort of how they fit in with uh, accessibility. Thanks, Justin. Um, so I help run programming at Buell Planetarium and Observatory. We do star shows for the public. We have telescopes on our roof, and um, many of you may have even seen me at the star party last night. Uh, one of the challenges with astronomy is that most of the data that we intake is light, right? And, uh, and much of the way that, that people ordinarily, when you know, traditionally when we make planetarium programs, it's all very light-based. Um, and we've been really striving to uh, add to that. There are some demonstrations that we've done that are really helpful, like we've had meteorites, for instance, which many of you have already seen our meteorites. And that's a tactile, and you can actually see, this is great, Jack here is amazing. Uh, he is our oldest staff member. He is in his mid-80s, and he absolutely loves this stuff. And he's showing off how to make, um, we, we make comets, and then we also have these real-life meteorites that people can handle. And no matter who you are, the tactile experience of that is a, is a really big Part of it, that's what everybody wants to do when they see a meteorite. It's not just a program that's only for some people. And I think that's pretty pretty awesome. We've also gotten into some tactile star maps and things like that. We have some of them printed out on one of those tables there. We also have star globes um, that we print out. Uh, and I think it's been a real adventure. I mean, we still are looking for ways to make it better and better. Um, and one of the goals that we have here at SciAccess is that, I mean, we have this room full of really amazing brains out there, and I want to know what some of your ideas are as well. Um, but yeah, uh, the planetarium is, is a really remarkable space. We've done things, like we, the planetarium can be kind of overwhelming for some people. For instance, we do sensory sensitive days there. Often, in a traditional planetarium show, I mean, the, the light levels change dramatically. The uh, sound can be somewhat surprising to people. If it's something like a laser show, it's really intense. Um, and so we're able to, you know, working with, with Justin and the Accessibility Task Force, as well as working with some community groups, we've been able to develop sensory sensitive programming, uh, changing some of our policies, like allowing people to enter and exit the planetarium in the middle of a show, which is typically not something that we do. Um, and, and we've really seen a, a brilliant response. And when you can deliver a planetarium program to, to anybody, really, and they really feel engaged with it, it's a remarkable thing. You change people's lives with programs like this. And it's um, something that we're really uh, passionate about giving that experience to as many people as possible. And that's why we're here today, to help do that even better. So, Great. Thanks, Rob. Uh, and so... We don't have all the answers. Uh, there are still a lot of challenges that we overcome every day. Um, communication is a big one, including policy changes to getting out to all of our staff members. Um, we have all user restrooms, like I mentioned, but getting that out to the public and letting them know that we have those has been a challenge. Uh, amongst other things, we had, we've had wheelchairs for 20 years, and we brought a couple of those out at our accessibility resource table for our sensory sensitive days and people are like, oh, we had no idea you had these available. And it's like, uh, so we're, it's an ongoing challenge, both internally, externally, um, with accessibility. Um, the sign on the right there is something we added um, for our Da Vinci exhibit that we have there currently, um, just listing all of the resources that we have uh, for folks. Um, staff buy-in is still a challenge, even though we've done all these amazing things. Uh, we're still having challenge with some of our um, folks who have been there for a long time and want to use the excuse that this is how we've always done it, uh, which is always a famous line, which I hate. Um, so uh, staff buy-in is still kind of challenging. Um, budget is always um, an issue. Um, and then being reactive uh, versus being proactive uh, is a challenge that we're having. Um, some of those great examples uh, of each one of those challenges that we've had, um, staff buy-in with the stanchions. And so when we were talking about 
um, updating all of our spaces with the construction. We were talking about buying all new stanchions. Um, and I said, we need double stanchions. And then it was like, well, they're going to cost this much more money. And uh, really asked, you know, do we really need these? And I said, yes, we need the double stanchions because they, you know, somebody blind is going to come in and could potentially fall over and it's not going to detect it. And so uh, they went ahead and tried to buy the single stanchions anyway. <laughs> even though I said, no, it's against law, right? All this stuff. Uh, and it's the right thing to do. I gave all the excuses in a book. Uh, it actually came down from our home organization, our central organization of Carnegie Museums that said, no, this is a mandate now. We have to buy double stanchions. So that's how we ended up getting them. And it was a good I told you so moment uh, for me. Uh, so staff buying, it's a great example of that. Uh, being reactive and proactive. And so when we got the Da Vinci exhibit, there's two uh, films within that exhibit that does not have open, does not have captioning at all. Uh, and it took uh, a week for us to get the transcripts because I did not see, um, I did not see the exhibit up until when it opened. And so that was the first thing I noticed, because that's the first thing you see there is uh, a video with no captioning. And so it took us a week. So again, uh, making those decisions, I think, before the exhibit opens or at the day of uh, the exhibit opening. Um, and so just being creative or proactive in those things um, and getting staff buy in too. Uh, yeah, so those are some of the challenges. There's a hundred more challenges that I can list and give you a hundred more examples, but uh, it's just things we face every day, but um, it's worth it whenever you, uh, we had an adult night and we had a mom almost in tears uh, because she wouldn't bring her son any other time to the museum. And so, uh, except for the sensory hours. So it's those moments you take the small wins and the small victories um, that outweigh all the challenges. Um, it makes it worth it. So that's enough of us talking. Um, we're going to do small group discussions. There are four, well, four topics, I should say, um, around the room. Uh, you can pick whichever group you would like to be part of, and you're welcome to move between groups if you'd like. Um, but we're going to give about 15 minutes to discuss-ish, uh, now that we're up against time. Uh, so we'll give you some time to discuss those and write down your thoughts on those poster paper. Um, and then we'll share out after. And so the four questions are, who enforces access policy at your organization? How do you get staff buy-in in terms of access? What role does training play at your own organization? What inaccessible facility changes, challenges have you faced? What are some creative solutions to those challenges? And how do you solicit internal, uh, which is staff? Uh, and or community feedback. So those are the four topics and they're spread out. There's a couple of ones that are doubled up. Um, I believe the first question and the second question are doubled up on this side. Um, so you're welcome uh, to move to the group that has it on this side, whatever you want to do. Um, but if you want to go ahead and move to whatever group you would like um, and you guys can start discussing um, those topics and getting down your notes. Great. Any questions? Great. One quick note, um, you, we, you don't need to actually work at one of these organizations to have opinions on these things. So no matter who you are, we really want to hear what your ideas are. Um, so like if you don't, in, you know, if you don't, if no one enforces the policy at your organization because you don't have one, that's like, that's okay, but who do you think should and things like that, you know, be creative with your answers. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. Justin and I will also sort of circulate around the room over the next 15 minutes answering questions and, uh, yeah, I appreciate having you all here uh, to help us make awesome stuff available for everybody. Yes. Sure, I'll let Justin handle that. Yeah, while you guys are thinking about what area you want to go, what question you answer. So our community groups, we just reached out. Um, when we first started, we had a challenge come in that um, somebody with autism came in and felt judged. And so a community member, their advocate reached out and uh, voiced their issues. Um, and it kind of actually started a relationship with that person, that advocate that helped us with training, with free training. They helped us form community members. So our community group Prior to, we had a sensory adult night. Um, we had folks who had autism. We had folks who were advocates, parents, 
um, come in. We had about 10 individuals come in um, to give us feedback, both on the planetarium shows that they were going to see, what the night was going to look like, cost, time of day, all of that stuff. Um, and so just reaching out and talking to people um, is sort of our community partnerships that we've done. And it's, it's led, actually, I'm on the board of directors at one of them, which has been great um, within the last six months. So uh, it led to that, which started five years ago with one complaint. So yeah. Great. Yes. Yeah, so that's a temporary exhibit, and we do uh, we have two signs at the Da Vinci. We just got one installed at the ticket counter with all of the things we have people can borrow day of. So backpacks, uh, wheelchairs, portable stools. One of the biggest complaints we've gotten was seating in our galleries. So we got creative, and we just got portable stools. So the only pain is people have to carry them around, but they can plop it down wherever they want to and sit on it. So uh, that's been a sort of a creative solution and cheap. Yeah, so if you guys want to go ahead and work on your smaller groups there, we have some time. Uh, we'll give you about 10 minutes now. Uh, and then we'll take some question and answers after as well. So if you have questions, uh, keep those until after, um, and we'll share out too. Great. OK. Just because of time, it sounded like there were some great conversations. But uh, unfortunately, I looked, there is a session after us. so. Uh, 10 minutes after us, so we have to clean up quickly uh, after, but we want to get going and make sure we share some things out and then have some time for questions and answers as well. Uh, but we'll be here today, too, um, throughout the day. Uh, we'll put our contact information up as well at the end, so um, the conversation doesn't have to stop here necessarily. Uh, so the first one, does anybody want to shout out who enforces access policy at your organization, and how do you get staff buy-in in terms of access? Does anybody want to share anything out with that one? Yes. Uh, so we kind of talked about how, oh, sure. Uh, Keegan and I talked about how, at, uh, so I work at a science museum and Keegan works at a STEM high school. Um, and we both ha had a similar experience with our access policy kind of being, policy being kind of nebulous and um, not really defined. Uh, Keegan used this really great phrase, play to the gray, where it's just like, kind of say, like in my facility, we, you know, our mission state, or part of our strategic plan is say value, inclusivity, and equity in our programs and stuff like that. And that's really it. So there's not like a, a way to enforce that. Um, that. I do, or I am, a, I co-chair our equity, diversity, inclusion task force, which we only like make recommendations and then whether they're applied are accepted is at the discretion of our board and CEO. Um, and so from it's hard to get that institutional buy-in um, from the rest of the staff if we're only technically making recommendations and need the approval of uh, our the board and our CEO. Um, do you want to share what you were saying? Sure. Um, so my high school has, we're a rural STEM high school, we're independent, we're public, um, which kind of puts us in a really interesting place. We have 2,000% of the national um, average for um, transgender students. Um, and a lot of the staff's very supportive of them. Um, we have a very active GSA um, for being a, a rural high school. Um, but I'm, it feels to me like our admin wants to support, but they also want to um, kind of keep things going smoothly with the parents. So, you know, I've, I, as an art teacher, when I've done displays or like my students have won awards where I put their preferred name on, you know, their artwork or their display or something, in their communications home and in their sort of messaging to the community, they always use the student's legal name, which might not be the same. So that's kind of created some irritation and, and we kind of worked under this sort of assumption that we're you know my job is to support the students so I'm going to use their preferred name and admin deals with the parents so they're going to kind of do what's best for them and their decisions for the school so our, our policy is really kind of more enforced by administration um, but I think the teachers are more they have I guess more buy-in than admin does necessarily so it's kind of a weird reversal thank you uh, great response uh, next one, what role does training play at your own organization? 
Anybody have anything to add for that one? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, training is kind of our biggest obstacle. So I work at um, a museum center. So we are a science museum, a history museum, a children's museum, an Omnimax theater, and I can keep going on. It's a lot. Um, but it's wonderful. Uh, we get to play in a lot of areas. But on the flip side, it's very challenging in the accessibility world because you're dealing with how do you make science accessible and history accessible and a children's museum accessible and all kind of things. And we've um, really hit the ground running hard. Our, our museum underwent a two and a half year restoration where um, two of the three permanent museums were closed for that entire time. In the children's museum, we swore to the public would never be closed and then we had to close it for three months. Um, so. So we just reopened in November, and so we're rolling out exhibits as we go, which has been really cool as we've been able to partner with community organizations and like co-open things in Braille and all of that other things. But anyways, so we've built in, um, we've built in uh, adult changing tables and quiet zones and all this stuff. But, but the kicker is our staff hasn't been trained. Um, and so we have all of these amazing things and we have community partners that I've built fast and deep relationships with who are saying, hey, we'll come in and we'll do this training, we'll do this training. But th the big uh, stumbling block for us is who, and this I don't have an answer to it, um, but who pays for the staff's training time? And that that is the big hard thing. We have an overarching staff of about 300 people when we talk about um, people who are working in food services or whatever, and um, it is my belief, and I would assume shared belief in this room, that uh, everyone needs to have the same training because we're only as strong as our weakest link. And so if somebody has an access question, they're going to go up to the closest museum people and not realize, like, oh, I work in food services. I don't have the answer. Um, and so that, for us, is, is currently our biggest hurdle is, like, okay, it's budget season. Everything has to be tight. We just moved in. But we need this training, but how do we cover it? So this is this is our... <laughs> this is me saying I don't have any answers, but I had to come to this group because it's hands down our biggest hurdle. Are you from Cincinnati Museum I Center? Am oh my gosh, I know people from Cincinnati. I am, yeah. You guys have had some challenges. Yeah. I know a few people. <laughs> 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 I know some people from the Cincinnati Museum Center. Yeah. 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 Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'd love to. That was one of our biggest challenges is we actually got all of our managers together and did a brainstorming session similar to this and said, what are the biggest barriers in budget and uh, time were the biggest things. And so we, uh, we could talk later, but we ended up eliminating both those by getting a grant and having trainings before or after hours. So, yeah, cool. Uh, so we'll move on because we're running out of time. What inaccessible facility changes have you faced? What are some creative solutions to those challenges? Anybody want to add anything? Quick point. Okay, we're moving on then. Uh, <laughs> if you want to talk after that, sorry. How do you solicit internal staff and or community feedback? Okay, here you go. Okay. Uh, so basically, I think a lot of people have already kind of talked about how we're just really listening. So when we do get a comment, we take it very seriously and we talk to the individual and then um, making sure that that comment gets processed and being transparent with people that, well, this is something, you know, that is going to cost a lot of money and finding a tactical way of saying it, of course, um, but that we are, it is on our mind and then maybe checking back in every now and then with them to build a relationship of trust. Um, and then other ways uh, is to make it part of your values, like we also talked about. We th I thought um, we could put it in job descriptions. Just we have a line in there about guest relations, but maybe that could just be altered to say all guests and using good practices and blah blah blah. Um, and then thinking about how to capture with the staff things. Um, so we, after each event, we have a, something we call the captain's log and the event planner for our internal events asks each of the departments how things went. So we've been able to get some things that our staff have noticed and then ask them for ideas and try to work on that. Okay, uh, so we'll grab those poster papers after. Um, is there any other bigger questions anybody has? Um, I'll put our contact information up there. I have business cards at the front desk, uh, so you can reach us both. 
by emailing me because somebody forgot their business cards uh, on their desk. It's okay. We'll forgive Ralph. Uh, any questions for us? Yes. Yeah. Do you have a statement on your website about accessibility and like a quick link, or do you have like audio assisted somehow on your website so that people can actually perceive that? Yeah, so our website's been an interesting journey as well because it wasn't accessible and we got in some uh, hot water with that. Uh, so I believe it's up to date now. And so we do have an accessibility page. We used to not have one. We have an accessibility page now. And another challenge too, so we're one of four museums under Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh. Uh, and so when we do a diversity statement, it has to kind of go through our home organization. Um, and right now, there's no director of diversity and inclusion at that level. Um, and so when we change our whole statement, it's kind of on a holding pattern right now. Uh, we do have an accessibility statement on our website. Um, but our diversity statement under like where our mission is listed is not good at all. It's one sentence. It's horrible. Uh, but the it's funny you bring that up because in our diversity and inclusion group, which is um, a different group than our accessibility group, we're starting to about that diversity statement and what it looks like on our website. Um, I know Coastside does a great job with uh, their statement too, so um, yeah, I'm envious of theirs, but we'll get there uh, eventually. It's just another, put it on the list of things to do. Yeah. Yes? Um, when you changed your uh, bathroom signs, did you have trouble getting any institutional buy-in or come or have folks within your staff uh, be fearful of what your guests would say? Uh, yeah, so that that policy was actually rushed, rushed out by our HR department, which was unfortunate because they sent out information and we had to go back and try to prepare our staff members and just train them on what ifs. Um, we're actually rehashing that now because we, uh, we also changed our bathroom policy where um, visitors and staff can use the bathroom that they're most, most comfortable with. Um, and so we're sending out, resending that policy out soon. And so um, I think what we're gonna do, because bathroom policy, we had some pushback with staff members of like, what does this even mean? And what are, what are you talking about? And visitors, we've had, we had one complaint, which was a ridiculous complaint because uh, about all user, the language, and then we had one because, again, communication. They didn't know where the all user restrooms were, um, and so it was communication. We've had minor pushback, but um, nothing major yet. Um, but we're resending all of that information out. So we're going to have like brown bag lunches for staff members who have questions or um, want to have feedback and things like that to listen to them. So does that answer your question some? Yeah. Great. Uh, anything else? Any other questions? Or a little, about a minute over time, I'm sorry. I didn't respect all of your time. Yeah, anything else? Okay, great. Uh, so we'll be around the conference today. Uh, my cards are up here. Feel free to play with any of the stuff on the tables as we're cleaning it up. We have some additional toys up here and tactile stuff in our backpack. So uh, yeah, thanks for, having, thanks for attending and thanks for having us here at the conference.